Hello students, we are continuing chapter 4. Let us begin with section 39 of the act provides for the procedure or the manner in which these orders have to be implemented. Section 39 deals with execution of the orders passed with the commission wherever it imposes a monetary penalty. Because most often if you were to observe when we go to the penalties chapter, it will deal with see it in course of our discussion powers con have been conferred upon the commission to pass various orders to regulate uh, the uh, any activity which would adversely affect competition in India. For the purpose of it, an application under section 39 can be made for executing the orders passed by the commission. I am not going on to the uh, verbatim of the language for the purpose of understanding uh, how the orders are executed under section 39. For the purpose of your understanding, I am giving a gist of the language captured under section 39. 39 says a penalty imposed will be recovered as per a regulation specified. Basically, the commission would frame a regulation for the purpose of recovering the penalty imposed by it. And at times, in the opinion of the commission, if the commission feels there is a necessity to make a reference to the income tax authority uh, for the purpose of recovering the penalty imposed, it can do so by referring, uh, by directing or by referring, we cannot use the word directing, but by referring the recovery process to the income tax authority to recover it under the procedure contemplated under the Income Tax Act. Under section 39, it further goes to uh, read that a person upon whom a penalty is imposed, such a person would be treated as an SSC under the definition of SSC under the Income Tax Act and the procedure for recovery of the penalty would be done in the process where the SSC is considered as a defaulter of payment of income tax. So basically, uh, the procedure contemplated under Income Tax Act would be applied uh, and the person upon whose the penalty is imposed will be considered as an SSC in default and the, uh, uh, the penalty imposed will be recovered by procedure laid down under the Income Tax Act. Let us deal with issues uh, which relate to uh, act, uh, um, incidents which adversely affect uh, competition regime in India and these acts which when they occur outside the place of India. Section 30 talks about certain acts that take place outside India but having an effect on the competition in India. The commission has been conferred power by virtue of this section and the language of section 32 reads as follows. The commission shall notwithstanding that any agreement referred to in section 3 has been entered into outside India or B any party to such agreement is outside India C any enterprise abusing the dominant position is outside India D a combination has taken place outside India or E any party to combination is outside India or F any other matter or practice or action arising out of such agreement or dominant position or combination is outside India. The commission, I am adding a word here, the commission has the power to enquire in accordance with the provisions contained in section 19 which talks about investigate power of procedure for investigation, section 20, section 26, section 29 and 30 of the act into such agreement or abuse of dominant position or combination if such agreement or dominant position or combination has or likely to have an appreciable adverse effect on the comp uh, combination in the relevant market in India and it can pass such orders as it deemed fit in accordance with the provisions in this act. To put it in one line and simple sense, the commission's hands are quite far stretched and a person who is a party to, a, to an incident uh, which contravenes section 3, 4 and 5 of the act and claims that he has not committed such an act within the territorial limits of India, the commission can extend itself and draw an inference by his actions if it has an adverse impact on the relevant market in India. Basically, commission is being conferred additional powers to examine aspects where it f the, which, which relates to uh, incidents which fall uh, outside the limits of India as well. 
The other important section that we are going to discuss is section 35 which talks about appearance before the commission. Section 35 basically provides there is always this discussion keeps coming. Who are the people who can appear before the commission? Most often traditionally what we understand is it is the lawyers or the legal practitioners who always appear uh, before any, judicious, any judiciary or any quasi judicial authority or a tribunal. Now for the purpose of clarity and understanding section 35 uh, sets out who are the persons who can actually appear before the commission. The language of section 35 is as follows. A person or an enterprise or the director general may either appear in person or authorize one or more chartered accountants or company secretaries or cost accountants or legal practitioners or any of his or its officers to present his or its case before the commission. A permission is given uh, for the director general to allow the four kinds of practitioners uh, to appear before the commission. One is chartered accountants, two is company secretaries, three is cost accountants, four is legal practitioners. Please note in the explanation of section 35, it provides clearly as to who are these people. It clarifies chartered accountant means one who has permission to practice as a chartered accountant. Company secretary means somebody who is qualified company secretary who has got the permission to operate as a company secretary. Cost accountants also shall have uh, permission and license to be cost accounts to be designated as cost accountants. Similarly, legal practitioners should be also having the license to be designated as legal practitioners. Only upon this satisfaction will these uh, specified persons will be allowed to appear before the commission. Now, let us look at the provisions uh, which relate to the powers of the commission to regulate its own procedure. Regulate its own procedure is more particular to be seen from the perspective of uh, the process of adjudication of any issue that is brought before it. To discharge its functions uh, under the act, the commission is to guide itself by the principles of natural justice and subject to the rules made by the central government, the commission has the power to regulate its own procedure. This aspect is discuss discussed under subsection 1 of section 36 of the act. Subsection 2 of the section 36 uh, say, uh, sets out a procedure as to how the process of summoning, the process of discovery of and production of document and receive of evidence uh, uh, in form of affidavit is to be regulated. Uh, for the purpose of this, let us understand the language of subsection 2 of section 36. For the purpose of discharging, I am reading only the relevant part of the section and please uh, pay attention and you will have to read it in tandem with the language already provided uh, under the uh, act. For the purpose of discharging its functions under this act, the same powers are vested in a civil court under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 while trying a suit. Basically it is saying the procedure contemplated under uh, while trying a suit in respect of a summoning and enforcing the attendance of any person and examining him on oath, b requiring the discovery and production of documents, c receiving of evidence on affidavits, d issuing commissions for examination of witness or documents, e requisitioning subject to provisions of section 123 and 124 of the Indian Evidence Act 1872, any public record or document of copy of such record or document from any office. If you were to observe the language uh, of this subsection 2, it is quite clear that any case is being tried before the commission, it will act like a civil court and for the purpose of uh, discharging uh, certain uh, aspects, uh, the, the commission will uh, follow the procedure laid down under civil procedure court for issues relating to discussed at subsection A to subsection E, it is quite clear. Going further under section 36, the commission is also been conferred the power to call upon such experts from the fields of economics, commerce, accountancy, international trade and from any other discipline as it deems necessary to assist the commission in the conduct of any inquiry by it. So, this is also an additional uh, kind of assistance the commission uh, is allowed to take for the purpose of adjudicating any issues that, that is brought before it. Further, the commission also has the power to direct any person. This is in addition to what has been provided under subsection 2 uh, of uh, section 36. 
the Commission may also direct any person to produce before the Director General or the Secretary of any officer authorized by it such books or other documents uh, in the custody or under control of such person so directed as may be specified or described in the direction being documents relating to any trade the examination of which may be required for the purpose of this act. So basically the commission can direct any person to produce certain relevant document as specified under uh, subsection 4, subsection A uh, to be submitted or furnished to the director general for examination. B similarly under subsection B of subsection 4 it, the commission may also direct a person to furnish to the director general or su such authorized person uh, in, uh, information with respects to trade of such or such other information as may be in po his position in relation to trade carried on by such person as may be required for the purpose of this act. I have not read the exact verbatim of the language as provided under the act, but for the purpose of your understanding, I have provided a simple explanation and I would request the students to read the language of it uh, in tandem with the explanation provided by me. With that, we will move on to the next chapter which talks about duties of the Director General. This chapter has only one section and it only deals with duties of the Director General. Section 41 deals with the Director General to investigate contravention. Let us understand the language of the section. The Director General shall, so directed by the Commission, assist the Commission in investigating into any contravention of the provisions of this Act or any rules or regulations made thereunder. For the purpose of this, under subsection 2 of, of section 41, the Director General is conferred all powers as conferred upon the Commission under subsection 2 of section 36 which we just discussed. For your understanding, I will just repeat subsection 2 of section 36. Subsection 2 of section 36 was uh, talking about the manner in which the summoning is done, uh, in a, the summoning of a party is done and the manner in which the party is allowed to file his documents and the manner in which the, the uh, Commission has the power to call for certain public records and the manner in which the party's uh, oath can be recorded. So basically, all those powers that have been conferred upon uh, the Commission under subsection 2 of section 36, a similar power is also conferred upon the Director General for the purpose of assisting the Commission in investigation. Subsection 3 of section 41 says, reads as follows that without prejudice to the provisions uh, of uh, subsection 2 of sections 240 and 240A of the Companies Act 56, so far as may be, shall apply to an investigation made by the Director General or any other person investigating under his authority as they apply to an inspector appointed under the Act. The purposes of this is there is an additional power of investigation conferred under subsection 3 uh, which is uh, taken off from the Companies Act and conferred upon uh, the Director General for the purpose of completing investigation. There is also an explanation provided to section 41 for the purpose of understanding the term central government and also the term magistrate. Subsection A of the explanation, the word central government under section 240 of the Companies Act shall be construed as the commission. This explanation is provided for the purpose that under uh, section 240 of the Companies Act, it is the word central government is getting substituted by the word commission for the purpose of implementing the objective of section 41 as being discussed by us. Similarly, under subsection B of section of explanation, the word magistrate under section 240A of the Companies Act uh, shall be construed as the Chief Metropolitan Magistrate, Delhi. 240 generally we come across a Chief Metropolitan Magistrate or a Magistrate is more seen from a perspective where a criminal proceedings are initiated because a Magistrate uh, presides over a, a proceeding which deals with criminal cases. So therefore, for the purpose of clarity uh, and understanding, the term Magistrate which is explained under Section 240A of the Companies Act is being shown as Chief Metropolitan Magistrate at Delhi for the purpose of uh, giving effect to the objectives of Section 41 uh, which talks about Director Generals uh, to investigate into contraventions. Which means for your understanding, suppose if there is a criminal proceedings initiated in that event as designated here, 
the chief metropolitan magistrate in Delhi would have jurisdiction for the purpose of dealing with a criminal issue uh, identified or raised by the commission on the directions of the director general uh, under this section. Hello students, having understood uh, chapter 5 which dealt with duties of the director general and his investigative powers, now let us move on to the next chapter which is chapter 6 which deals with penalties uh, for the contravention of the provisions of the competition act. Section 42 to 48 of the competition act deal with the penalties which talk about penalties wherein there is a contravention of the provisions of the act. To begin with, I will start with the first section that is section 42. Section 42 talks about contravention of orders of the commission. For the purpose of understanding this section, you need to first understand what are the sections that are considered to be contravening the provisions of the act. Under subsection 2 of section 42, it says any person who fails to comply with the directions or the orders of the commission issued under section 27, 28, 31, 32, 42A and 43A would be considered as, as a sort of contravention of the provision under the act. And the penalty that is imposed for contravening these provisions is it is considered as punishable with fine which may extend to rupees 1 lakh for each day of non-compliance subject to a maximum of rupees 10 crores. Further under this subsection 3 of section 42 deals with a situation where failing to comply with the uh, subsection 2 of section 42 directions shall without prejudice to the proceedings initiated under section 39 of the act shall be sentenced with an imprisonment for a term which may extend to 3 years or with fine which may extend to 25 crores or with both as may deem fit by the chief metropolitan magistrate Delhi. For the purpose of our understanding for conducting any sort of a proceedings which involve uh, imposition of a sentence the, co the designated court is the chief metropolitan magistrate Delhi and a proviso is being provided at, uh, to section 42 which says that only upon a complaint received from the commission or its authorized officer can the chief metropolitan magistrate take cognizance of the offence referred to it. So therefore, this becomes the most important catch that no other person can bring a complaint before the chief metropolitan magistrate other than the commission or its authorized officers. With that, we will move on to the next section which is section 42A which deals with compensation in case of contravention of orders of commission. As the title speaks for itself, whenever there is a contravention of an order passed by a commission, then such an aggrieved person can file an application for recovery of compensation for the loss suffered due to the non-compliance with the orders of the or directions of the commissions passed under section 27, 28, 31, 32 and 33 and section 43. A penalty is imposed uh, for this, a, pen a penalty laid down here is a penalty for failure to comply with the directions of the commission under section 36 subsection 4 and subsection 2, directions of the director general under section 41 2, all of you must be familiar with 41 which we just dealt with which deals with are considered to be punishable with a fine which may extend to rupees 1 lakh for each day of non-compliance subject to a maximum of rupees 1 crore. So, if you observe the penalty being imposed for no contravention of the provisions is quite high under the competition act. Moving on to the next section that is section 43A which talks about power to impose penalty for non-furnishing of information on combinations. Failure to give a notice under subsection 2 section 6 to the commission shall be liable for a fine which may extend to 1 percent of the total turnover of the assets whichever is higher of such combination. If you observe now this relates directly to disobedience of the provisions of section 6 which talks about regulation of combination and this section 43A directly lays down a sanction for failure to comply with section 6 subsection 2. The next section is section 44. Section 44 deals with any false statement made by a person which is called by the commission. The penalty for making false statement or omission to furnish material information regarding a combination which leads which shall lead to 
a penalty which shall not be less than rupees 50 lakhs or to, to a, or maybe to the maximum of rupees 1 crore so this section 44 basically deals with furnishing furnishing of false statement or omission or not furnishing information as called for the commission so there is also a penalty where there is a disobedience with regard to non supply of information or supplying false information which is called by the commission section 45 deals with penalty for offence in relation to furnishing of information this is again dealing with furnishing of information which says failure to furnish information or if inf if if the person furnishes false information or omits to furnish such information as called by the commission is liable for penalty which may extend to rupees 1 crore and the commission may pass such other orders in connection there too. If you observe both the sections 44 and 45, 44 particularly deals with information relating to combinations which are called for by the commission and section 45 deals with general information which are called by the commission in relation to the any of the inquiry initiated under the provisions of this act which to, to check if there is adverse impact on the competition regime in India. Both the sections relate to furnishing of information in two different contexts. The next section that deals with penalties is section 46. Section 46 talks about power to impose lesser penalty. Now this is an interesting feature of the act where it provides the commission with the, po the power to impose a lesser punishment subject to certain conditions. Now what are the conditions? This particularly deals with cartels. Now cartels generally can hold a dominant position and the players therein in a cartel could be traders, sellers, producers or a distributor or a service provider. Now one of the conditions that is laid down under section 46 is if the trader or seller or a, a producer or a service provider any of them disclose complete information to the commission regarding an alleged contravention of the provision of any act in such event the commission may consider to impose lesser penalty provided such a disclosure shall be made by the aforesaid persons much prior to completion of inquiry under section 26. I think you must be familiar with section 26 by now. Section 26 lays down the procedure for conducting an inquiry initiated under section 19 of the act. This is an important uh, proviso which means a voluntary disclosure of information relating to alleged contravention of the provisions of the act will absolve to some extent and may allow the commission to impose a lesser pen, uh, penalty as compared to what is prescribed under the penalty clauses. The next section is section 47. Section 47 generally talks about what would happen to all the penalties connected, collected in form of penalties imposed and punishments uh, uh, imposed on the persons contravening the provisions of this act. Section 47 says that all penalties collected under this act shall be credited to the Consolidated Fund of India. This is again provided to ensure that there is a uh, transparency with regard to the funds amounts collected in form of penalty. The next section is section 48 which talks about contravention by companies. As you all understand a person is defined to mean even a company and the larger definition for a uh, inclusive definition of a company is enterprise. So persons contravening the provisions of this act are liable to be punishment provided if the person proves that the contravention was committed without his knowledge such a person will be exempted. Now this is to be understood section 48 to be understood more from a perspective of participation of a person while working under a company uh, or on the concept of a company further. However, it, it goes on with the under same section it is also provided that if the contravention is attributable to solely an officer of the company such officer is liable for punishment. Whenever a prosecution is initiated against a company Penalty is imp imposed twofold. One, on the artificial entity called the company. Company is a fiction, which is an artificial body, but has its own seal and uh, signature to operate. But the persons running it can also be prosecuted by way of imposing penalty on them if they are found to contravene the provisions of the act as specified in this section. With this section 48, we have completed a chapter of penalties and we will move on to the next chapter that is 
chapter 7. Chapter 7 contains only one section, that is section 49. And section 49 basically deals with competition advocacy. This is a kind of section which mandates the commission to indulge itself in terms of propagating, spreading message about uh, competition act and also imparting some sort of a training on competition issues. Under this provision, under this uh, provision of 49, the competition commission has also been uh, empowered with uh, powers to formulate certain policies which may be important for facilitating a competitive regime in India. It can submit such a policy to the government of India. The government of India may consider, may not consider and such a policy does not bind the government of India or the state government. Basically, the commission can only make certain policies for the benefit and to give effective implementation of the provisions of this act. Under section 49, the commission has to take steps to, for promotion of competition advocacy, to create awareness and impart training on the competition issues in India. Section 49, as you understand, is basically a kind of mandate on the commission to ensure that the commission facilitates all those activities that go in furtherance of implementing the provisions of the Act. With that, we have completed three chapters, that is chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7. We have comprehensively dealt with various issues, uh, particularly dealing with duties of the Director General and the penalties that are imposed for contravening the provisions of this Act and also the mandate on the uh, Commission to take out competition advocacy.